analyzed and um, um, portions of the document were uh, modified and recir recirculated to the public for their comments and those comments were responded to. Basically, um, what the department is asking is a um, recommendation to the Board of Transportation Commissioners, which was approved, and the report is before you, is to vacate and set aside the uh, certification of the original uh, final environmental impact report and all the organizational approvals uh, certify the new environmental document that includes all the modifications and the changes, adopt the CEQA findings and a statement of overriding considerations for the project, adopting the mitigation monitoring and reporting uh, program for the project, as well as approving the uh, uh, franchise um, application. Um, with me today are my colleagues, Mr. William Jones from uh, Public Works Department of, uh, uh, Department of Public Works Bureau of Engineering, Mr. Sigmund Shu from City Attorney's Office, and City's uh, consultant, Mr. Uh, Bruce Lacker. Um, before I finish, I need to mention one um, issue. One of the documents that we have before you is a mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and at the bottom of that document it says uh, draft version basically we reviewed and that was a copy we had from 2009. It's the uh, same document that hasn't been any changes to basically we left it as it is. Okay. Uh, well, those who have uh, filled out cards, did you understand what that was all about? Okay. So what I'd like to do is ask staff to move to the side a bit and I want to bring up the, the comment cards. Uh, there's uh, one against by the name of Rosalie uh, Preston. Uh, there's a, a Jamie Hernandez who doesn't say if he's for or against or whatever. You're the second one. Uh, and then I have uh, uh, four that are in favor of it. Uh, Yvonne Briggs, uh, Joaquin Lantos, uh, Ralph uh, Venezuela, and, and Ben Thompson. So if we could just start with Rosalie Preston. Come on up. Uh, where are you? Uh, and how about Jamie Hernandez? Um, come on up. Yvonne Briggs, come on up. Joaquin Lampus, come on up. Let's sit on the chairs. Let's get moving. We've got a lot of other issues, lots of people in the room here care about all kinds of issues today. So we're going to move as quickly as we can. Uh, go for it. Your name, please, for the record. Uh, I'm Rosalie Preston. I'm the chairperson of the Harbor Gateway North Neighborhood Council. And uh, although the agenda does not reflect it, we filed a community impact statement in 2009. And I disagree with the uh, legislative assistant that anything has changed. It's the same file number. We have the same issues. Whichever route that is chosen, whether the main route that Westpac prefers or any of the most of the alternatives, that pipeline will, in phase two, will travel under the streets in our neighborhood, the Harbor Gateway North. We are opposed to it because of the long-term impacts, the likelihood that, that such a large diameter pipeline will leak into the groundwater, and, and we are, are still opposed to this project. And we feel that the environmental impact report, I thought there was another aspect that was supposed to be looked at, which was the adequacy of the um, global warming impact. Jet fuel is a known um, contributor to global warming. And I don't, we don't feel that the environmental impact report adequately addressed that. Okay. Staff, make a note to yourself to respond to that when we come back up. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate your comments. Um, the other, the next gentleman was, was um, is it Jamie Hernandez? Right here, Jamie. Yes, please. Were you for or against or? I'm, I'm, I'm for it. I'm You're for it. Okay. Of it. Speak. Okay. Uh, first of all, my name is Jaime Hernandez. I'm a member of Local 802 for the last 25 years, and uh, I've noticed how the employment has really changed over the years. Over the 25 years, this has got to be the worst. Everybody knows it. Uh, Everybody knows that employment is bad. Uh, part of my job as an organizer with the union is, is to talk to non-union workers and union workers. And I just don't see how these guys are getting along with paying their rent and supporting their families. We should have had this project going three years ago, and these people would have been employed. So I ask you for your support, and uh, I myself support this Jetline Fuel project. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your comments. Uh, Ralph? 
Oh, Ralph, are you in the back there? Come on up as he leaves. Thank you, sir. Okay, we'll just go down the list. Um, I'm Ivan Briggs. Yeah, great. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And um, I'm here in support of the project. Um, we feel that it's going to bring uh, much needed jobs to the area. It's a safer way of uh, transporting uh, fuel. It's going to get trucks off the road, better for the environment. I'm going to keep it real short, um, but we're in favor of this project. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Joaquin Santos, and I'm with Laborers Union Local 802. Our local union is located in Wilmington. We've been there since 1935. We participated in hundreds, if not thousands, of projects in the harbor. And we are here today because we are in support of Westpac's pipeline project uh, for the obvious reasons that my partners already mentioned. Uh, work is very slow. The recovery, really, we haven't felt or seen any of it. And this project will offer employment opportunities to a lot of young men and women that live in the community. Uh, it will offer them an opportunity into a career with good paying benefits, uh, good wages. And we, like my partner mentioned, we've been here two years ago. We were here before the same committee. And we would just like your support in making the proper recommendations and moving this project forward so that the next time we meet with, uh, as a group with our folks, uh, hopefully it will be for a groundbreaking ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir. Hey, Ralph Bellin, who other Pacific Southwest Labor's Organizing Coalition. It's a real honor for me to, to sit here and talk today for, for a couple different reasons. Um, I was actually the labor foreman for this city hall retrofit project, and it's good to see um, some of the workers that worked on that project here today. And it, it, these big projects are, are far between, and and it's really really good to see the guys back there in the orange that are here. They're, you know, they don't they don't see this portion of the project, but they need to go to work so bad that, that they're here in support of this project. We ask you to we want to thank you for putting this project out. It's a large project. It's going to be a safe project using using certified laborers, construction workers from the city, and, and we, we're in support of everything you're doing with this project. Thank you. Thank you, sir, very much for that. Ben Thompson, he was our last speaker on the subject. Thank you guys for standing up like that. Appreciate it very much. Good afternoon, commissioners, or excuse me, committee members. My name is Ben Thompson. I'm with Westpac Energy. We are the project proponent. Just wanted to kind of refresh our memories as to why we're here and where we've been. This project, we've been going through this with the city for four years. The city has been very good on this. They've been very responsive, Bureau of Engineering and Department of Transportation. But this project was originally supposed to be in service in February 2009. And here we are in July of 2011, still going through the process. Um, Mr. Zaltash mentioned the, the lawsuit. Uh, the lawsuit alleged seven different defects in the EIR. Six of them were thrown out. The one that was left in was putting in more alternatives. That was done, which is why the city is back before you now. Um, the purpose of the project is, is important, too, is to eliminate bottlenecks in the Southern California fuel system, but also to replace aging infrastructure. Most of the pipelines that bring jet fuel these days are 40 to 80 years old, and we understand what can happen these days with infrastructure that gets old. So uh, just to remind ourselves, the previous EIR, as Mr. Zaltai said, was previously uh, unanimously approved by the Transportation Commission, by this body, the Transportation Committee, and the City Council. Uh, after going back through the process, we're back before you. The Transportation Commission has already unanimously approved it. We're now here before you, and then uh, after that, the next step is the City Council again. Um, so this project is supported by business and, as you can see, by labor. So we appreciate your consideration. We really would like to get this project underway for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is providing jobs to our uh, union members. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And the staff want to react to the one uh, comment uh, made by the Neighborhood Council uh, um, uh, lady about the issue there of the environment. Mr. Chairman, quickly, yeah. Mr. Uh, Bruce Lacker will add this back. Yes. Yes, comments. yes, good afternoon. My name is Bruce Lacko, yeah. President of Matrix Environmental, the city's environmental consultant on the project. Yeah. Um, what I heard from um, the speaker 
was general concern about pipelines in general, which is understandable, which is why we did a very comprehensive EIR, because the city was concerned about potential impacts and wanted to make sure that there was full and complete disclosure of any potential impacts that might be associated with the project, particularly as it would relate to impacts upon public health and also the environment of which she spoke. The only issue that I heard in specifics with regard to potential environmental impacts had to do with groundwater. The EIR addressed potential groundwater impacts during both construction and operations. It looked at the underlying groundwater conditions and the geologic structure along the entire pipeline route. The EIR concluded that with the application of already existing regulatory requirements at both the state and the local level, at the federal, state, and local level, in conjunction with a specific mitigation measure to protect any water wells that may be in the area, that any potential impacts related to groundwater would be mitigated to a less than significant level. The other specific comment I heard from the speaker had to do with greenhouse gas emissions. And let's just take a minute to clarify what the court really said on greenhouse gas. At that time, the time we did the document, greenhouse gas emissions and the whole climate change issue was really kind of in its infancy. Everyone was kind of trying to figure out what is this issue, how do you analyze it, what is the significance threshold, how do you mitigate it, all of that sort of things. And this project occurred at the very early stages of the GHG climate change emergence as an important environmental issue for the city and for the state as well. What the judge said was that the greenhouse gas emissions analysis that was in the draft EIR was adequate for the time that it was prepared. Given the amount of time that occurred subsequent to the preparation of the draft EIR and the court decision, considerable work was done by the California Air Resources Board, some special industry groups, and other agencies, the AQMD, that furthered the knowledge and basis for analyzing GHG. So the judge said, while I'm not going to set aside the analysis as being deficient, if you're going to go back and redo your document, which I'm going to make you do anyhow, because I found your alternatives analysis to be deficient, we suggest that you also take a look at the GHG issue in more detail in light of current regulations and current knowledge. So in the draft recirculated document, we included a very robust analysis of greenhouse gas emissions, consistent with how it's being done in other documents in the city, very cutting edge. We quantified all the emissions, both during construction and operations, and we applied the most stringent significance threshold that's available, which is the AQMD's stationary source threshold. Even though the project does not qualify as a stationary source, the regulations on stationary sources are more stringent than they are for mobile or other sources. So we applied the most stringent threshold that was available, and the project still resulted in a less than significant impact, well below the threshold levels established by the AQMD. As a point, as a last point of technical clarification, based upon research and testing conducted by the California Air Resources Board, jet fuel does not have any components that emit GHG gases. Okay, well, thank you very much. And Rosalie Preston, would you please, would you meet with her after this in the hallway and have a further discussion to go forward, assuming my colleagues want to move forward with this? Just to further clarify the groundwater issue, are we 100 percent sure that this will never impact groundwater with the current technology? Yeah. The project has many project design features built into it, like leak detection systems, that if there was a leak, first of all, it's not anticipated. The quality of the pipe, you know, if you look at it in terms of if you evaluate it in the context of the existing pipes that are in the street, those pipes are aging, and as we know, as pipes age, they have old technology, and they're more susceptible to problems. This is going to have to be made of state-of-the-art materials, current technology. Everything is going to be in place to really ensure that leaks never happen. 
Um, un you know, unfortunately, no one can guarantee that anything will never happen. So, you know, as EIRs are warrant to do, EIRs look at very conservative circumstances and say, what if? Even though the likelihood of it actually occurring is very, very limited, the EIR did do the what if analysis and determined that if there was a leak through, through the mechanisms that are in place, the, the amount of the leak would be very limited. And that, uh, that we also identified the hazardous materials departments, certain of the fire stations, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, are equipped with hazardous material units while others are not. And we identified the hazmat units that would be closest by that would be able to respond very quickly. So between a combination of a limited leak, quick response, that we felt that uh, through those procedures and processes, uh, the, the environment would be protected. Is there anything that we know of that's state-of-the-art that we aren't applying to this that we could apply? Um, not to my knowledge. So this, this is as good a system as, as potentially exists anywhere, and you're, it, it would appear close to 100 percent sure that uh, such a leak wouldn't exist. Yeah, I would, I would, I would, I know I would sleep better at night if I knew all pipelines were constructed of this material and, and of this integrity. Now, of course, I'm, I'm a little extra sensitive to it because uh, the first week I, I was in office, we had the explosive yeah. uh, pipeline break in Laurel Canyon, followed by another one that caused uh, a fire truck to fall into a huge sinkhole. So it certainly is high on my radar screen, but I recognize that's all using older technology as well. Yeah, and, and that really is the key. Um, so much has been learned um, over the over over the decades, and and this is one of those places where the technological advancements of our society are really extremely evident in terms of the materials. I mean, these, you know, they're using titanium to make the pipes out of. Uh, they're you know, they're X-raying the welds to make sure the welds are done properly. Uh, so the, the integrity that's built into the installation process far, far exceeded anything that was even imaginable when the pipelines that you were, that you were mentioning went in. And one of them was 100 years old, so uh, that I we can imagine. Have... Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. And thank you, Mr. Koretz, for asking that question. I appreciate your articulation on the whole issue there. Do I have a motion to move forward with this, Mr. Parks? So moved. Mr. Second. Brad, second. Okay. It's unanimous. We're going to move forward with this action to the full council. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> that is item number one and special agenda item number one combined. But now we have item number two, um, and it's being suggested that we could do this on consent. If it makes sense, colleagues, uh, could you please read item number two. Item number two is a CEO report relative to a DOT contract with My Transit Plus for the coordination and administration of the City Ride program for a five-year period for total compensation not to exceed $5.2 million. Now, Mr. Park, do you have any comments on this, please? I just have one question. Whether the current contract has lapsed or is this over overlapping? Good afternoon. Jim Lefton with the Department of Transportation. My Transit Plus Good. contract has currently been extended for six years, so that six year will expire at the end of August of this year. So this will be in play before that? Yes. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Koretz, any questions on this? No questions on that? Do we have a motion to Mr. Koretz to move this? So moved. And Mr. Park seconds yeah. it. It's unanimous. It's, it's approved. Uh, we can move on to item number three. Item number three is a DOT report relative to the hiring and deployment of part-time traffic officers. Okay. Item number three, uh, we're going to um, – this was approved, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Madam Clerk, in the uh, budget process uh, of 2011. It, this was included in the adopted 11-12 budget for um, authorization to hire up to 100 um, part-time traffic officers. Okay. So this is basically a report uh, that uh, is suggested is to be received and filed. Let's get our public comment questions that are here. We have one, two – Three, four, Do you remember what the five is? folks on this one. So we got four mics. So how about uh, Jason? Come on up from SEIU 721. Beverly, uh, I think it's Samuel from the Department of Transportation against the proposal. 
Uh, we have uh, Santa Cruz uh, Villera. Doesn't say for or against. That's number three. We have Luis uh, or Luis uh, um, Aragana, and then Gordon uh, McLeod. So if we could just take those seats, everybody, and and uh, we'll quick go through this as well, and look forward to your public comments. Uh, um, the first, uh, sir, sitting down there. Go for it. You go first. Yeah, and then as soon as he leaves, you can go sit there. That's okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, What's your name? My name is Luis Arseniega. Here, I'm here speaking against part-timers. Uh, my main concern, my main reason I'm not for part-timers is because, unfortunately, I see this uh, as you're as a, pretty much dangling a carrot in, in front of these people that need a job at this time. Uh, with that said, their main purpose once they get into the department is they, they're going to want full-time work. And that's something that's not even being offered to these people at all. So what they'll do is they'll go ahead and I see as they'll be writing citations. In our department, we have letter of the law and spirit of the law. So what they're going to write tickets is pretty much letter of the law. Whether they be good or bad tickets, they're just going to issue them, which leaves people like me and other officers work full time to come right behind them and try to explain a bad ticket. We already get enough grief for issuing incorrect tickets. I feel that the adding of part timers would only increase that and further bring a, a worse name on our department. I understand that the training period is like two weeks. We average one month in the classroom and two on the field. And we still don't, we don't, still don't know everything by the time we're on the field. You're, these people are not even being prepared properly to deal with the public. They, they told us during training, when you give a ticket, for you it's a piece of paper. For someone else, that's their livelihood sometimes. With bringing part-timers, all it is is them just writing pieces of paper. They won't take into consideration anything else. I think it's going to hurt more the public than would help them and would eventually hurt our department more with a bad name. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank your you. comments. Ma'am, good afternoon. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is uh, Santa Cruz Villarreal, and I am uh, also a traffic officer. And to add on to the other officer's comments, uh, we need to realize what a danger it will be if we have at-will employees working out in the field and dealing with the citizens especially with the current uh, reputation that we have right now, the news media, how bad we're looking. And then we send part-timers out there writing tickets and they're at will hired. There'll also be a danger to them, not, also, not only to the citizen. Also, I want to come to mind, this is the second time I come in front of this board. I've also come in front of management to try to plead with them, not to hire part-timers, but to hire full-time workers. It will be much, much cheaper and more cost efficient. Instead of uh, hiring 40 part-time officers, you should be hiring 20 full-time officers and getting more work out of them. And, and, and it's more cost efficient as far as benefits. You won't get as many IOD rates. And as far as um, ticket rates, also production. Also, all our services that we provide to our citizens, which you've known this past year, we've had a lot of incidents and um, uh, what we would call special unusual occurrences where you need traffic officers out in the field and out in the streets. Also, I would like to come to mind that we have all kinds of ideas. Sure. <laughs> Thanks for giving me that additional minute. <laughs> <laughs> we have all kinds of ideas as far as uh, production is concerned and also how to save money for our department and we've been trying to plead with management to meet with us so that we could make this issue uh, bring more money more money more revenue to our department than it would be to hire part-time workers um, I'm waiting for that day to come and hopefully and I'm pleading with you not to hire them to hire full-time workers and keep our city streets safe for our citizens and for the officers of this city 
You also know that our uh, officers, as far as games are concerned, they're an emblem. They're also a representation of our city. We would like to keep that going also. I'll go and pass it on. To Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate your comments. Yeah. Sir, may, may I defer to the, the members uh, of the union before I speak? Is that okay? Beverly, speak. Go for it. Sure. Um, good afternoon, and former 721 member, but 77 member. Um, I'm here to um, have the uh, transportation department uh, postpone the uh, implementation of part timers until further analysis is done. The potential impact not only on the workers, but the city's financial status. Um, you have a, a situation where, unless there's some unincorporated land in LA that hasn't been fitted with meters and signs already then someone's most likely enforcing that street. So uh, unfortunately, I think adding someone else on the block is only going to result in a shared result. So it's, it's a financial aspect from both standpoints of it. Um, I'm also concerned that by doing it without having as much information to base on in terms of does it affect the, the, like I said, the city's financial status, that if it does end in trial and error, can a city actually afford to have that kind of mistake and write it off. So again, unless there's some other land somewhere that doesn't have a meter, rest and believe there's an officer already there enforcing those streets. So I'm asking you guys to take the time, okay. have the department really look at the, the effects and where you would put those people and make sure they are not, they're adding to and not sharing. Because again, I don't see it financially um, helping you guys and it's definitely gonna affect and threaten the sanctity of full-time workers. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your comments. Sir. Good afternoon. Time doesn't allow me to explain all the issues. Name, sir. Gord McCullough, traffic officer. The time doesn't allow me to address all the issues concerning the part-timers. But what I can point out is that it takes two part-timers to raise to the productive rate of a full-time officer. What are we going to do with these part-time officers when they realize they cannot be made to write a ticket? Traffic officers do what we do because of our professionalism, our dedication, and our loyalty. We don't have part-time cops. We don't have part-time firemen. We don't have part-time paramedics because it demands a level of professionalism, loyalty, and commitment. My beat where I work on Melrose, I walk five hours a day. I am the face of the city. I'm the person that says where the bus stops, who your council member is, how you get the streets clean up. I've also recently rescued a young lady from her pimp. Can we from her what? From her pimp. Can we guarantee that a part timer can be as multifaceted as I am? They're one trick ponies. And when that pony gets tired and becomes city employee acclimated, you're gonna have a deadbeat on your hand. There's no future in them. There's nothing to look forward to. No benefits, no career, no lifestyle because they're at will employees. If the current level of management cannot raise the level of productivity and capture rate with the current TOs, what are they going to do with the part-timers? A little more cost analysis and the union being given the information we require to come forward to this committee with accurate information, we could show that TOs can do this job. Part-timers will be a burden on the citizens, and you'll hear it through the mail. <coughs> part-timers will be a burden on the department. Because what do you do with a bad employee? You get rid of them and replace them with another. It'll be a revolving door. You'll be paying out and gaining less in return. Thank you for listening to my comments. Thank you, sir, for your comments, sir. And I'm, I'm so glad that I waited because I, I don't think that I could have said it better. Jason Elias from uh, SEIU Local 721. I'm the regional coordinator for LA City. And really, um, you know, several folks just mentioned the professionalism of civil service employees. In fact, the civil service system is meant to protect both the public, the employees, and policymakers from either allegations of or performing your duties um, free, well, from uh, any other political consideration. So if you have an employee who can be fired at any time in the city of LA and is appointed based on, you know, uh, based on uh, who folks like rather than what we have in a civil service system, which is checks and balances to hire folks, um, these folks will be making decisions on the job in order to keep their job rather than doing their job as highly trained professionals as Officer uh, McCullough just spoke about. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that the part-time 
uh, traffic officers was tied in this year's budget um, to the implementation of furloughs in the city. We recently ratified uh, for uh, almost all the coalition of LA City unions an agreement which returns over $200 million uh, to the city, if I'm getting my numbers correctly. Uh, please correct, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Therefore, part-time officers are no longer needed in order, to, in order to meet that cost. What we need to do is hire full-time civil service professionals to continue to keep LA moving. Um, that that is the bottom line, and we don't we don't understand. We've made several information requests as the exclusive bargaining representative of of traffic officers for information from the CAO and from the department on cost analysis in terms of full cost recovery for uh, traffic officers. In other words, traffic officers are more than paid for their job if they're full time in civil service. Uh, we'd like to see those those numbers from the CAO. They're not forthcoming with those numbers. What is the rush here on the part-time piece? I think we need to look at how we can increase efficiencies in the department. We've, uh, since early, early, early this year, tried to sit down with the department on trying to implement some changes, bringing back uh, the uh, HPV, Habitual um, uh, Parking Violations Unit, back into existence, uh, some other big pieces, but the bottom line is, is this move is no longer needed because of the concessions that we made with the letter of agreement, and uh, we need that information so we can move forward on implementing cost savings before we actually go to bringing in intermittent part-time traffic officers. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, we're now joined by Mr. Labans, there's four members now of the committee. Uh, Staff, uh, would you come up for a quick second on this? Thank you all very much. Anyone from staff who can react to this? Just a quick comment, uh, Mr. Labange. We're we're on item number three. I've been brief. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Thank okay. you. Sorry for being late. Just a quick response uh, to that questionnaire, because this is a receive and file report. Go for it. Good afternoon, Council Members. My name is David Hirano. I'm with the Office of the CAO. Um, I'm joined here by Rudy Carrasco and um, Jaime De La Vega from the Department of Transportation. Um, where would you like us to start? Do you have specific Just questions? Just quickly, reaction to the comment, and this is a note and file on. Well, the, the implementation of part-time traffic officers was a element of the adopted budget that was recently passed, um, along with the um, implementation of the part-time traffic officer program. There was nine million dollars in incremental revenue, general fund revenue, plugged into the um, the city's budget. So um, at this point, the department needs to move ahead in order to implement the city's budget. If there is a desire to change that, you would have to change the adopted budget at this point. Okay, thank you. Any additional comments? Uh, can, I, can I ask you a question? Oh, yeah. could, you, could you comment on the issue of whether uh, the $9 million and the part-time employees had anything to do with the recent uh, MOU and the uh, furlough? Um, sure. The $9 million, from our perspective, is not tied to the imp implementation of furloughs. Could you say that louder? It is not tied to the implementation of furloughs. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. We have a, a motion to. Uh... Mr. Rosendahl, I have some comments. Oh, please. I'm sorry. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I, I've had a lot of concerns about this transition. Um, and I had similar concerns uh, years ago when I was on the West Hollywood City Council, and LA City was looking at contracting out this service. Um, and I came here and actually testified in opposition to that based on what I considered less than positive experiences in West Hollywood, where our contract people didn't care as, they cared a lot about writing tickets, but they didn't care about the quality of the tickets and the circumstances. And so as a result, West Hollywood achieved uh, a, a well-deserved reputation. Um, sometimes people referred to our, our traffic officers as ticket Nazis, because they gave people tickets under the toughest possible circumstances. They'd stand by the meter. The second it expired, they'd write them a ticket. Um, that's not the kind of, of enforcement I think we want in the city of Los Angeles. 
And uh, I do have a fear that um, part-time officers that are just writing tickets um, and possibly without uh, uh, adequate training um, may wind up uh, providing that same kind of service or lack of same. Um, what's our response to that? Typically, the department for a full-time traffic officer has two training modules. One is on parking enforcement, and the second is on traffic control, in addition to reviewing the overall policies and procedures of the department. For the part-timers, they'll be receiving the exact same training, training module for parking enforcement. So from that perspective, they'll be trained identical to full-timers in that area. Is there any additional time and on the job monitoring and anything else that is typically provided a full-time officer that won't be provided to a part-time officer? Deputy Chief Rudy Carrasco, LADOT. Uh, council member, uh, the, the exact same amount of supervision that we provide to our full-time officers will also be provided to our part-time officers. So do you have any of the concerns that, that were expressed uh, uh, here by those that, that have doubts about the part-time system? The part-time officers will be operating in the exact same environment as our full-time officers. Uh, we were providing them with the same equipment. We are providing them with the same amount of oversight. As a matter of fact, there will probably be more oversight because these particular part-timers will be placed in very tight, controlled beats. So uh, we expect that we will monitor their, their performance on a regular cycle. Uh, they will be evaluated monthly to determine uh, whether or not they're, they're adhering to all of the policies and procedures that are established within the Bureau. And is there any model elsewhere in the city or anticipation with this program of uh, transitioning folks from part-time into the, the full-time positions? Uh, David, let me start. Um, you know, Councilman, I'd have to do a little research and get back to you, that, but uh, I believe that we have other instances where we are using full-timers, or part-timers, excuse me. I'm just not sure to what degree they are, are transitioning into full-time positions. So we, if you'd like, we can try and get back to you with a more complete answer, a more I accurate answer. I think the advantage answer. of the part-time program from that perspective is the supervisors and management of the department will have experience with the part-timers. So if we end up with vacancies on the full-time side of the house, you know, we can actually promote and draw from the part-time pool. And they're already half trained, and then we can provide them with the additional training. So from that perspective, it's an advantage because you get to see people in a work environment ahead of time. Yeah, I know this item was also uh, referred to personnel committee. So if you could have answers about how we do it elsewhere and what we're looking at in terms of a career ladder um, for these, uh, I would appreciate it. I'm still not sold on the program, but I'm trying to be as open-minded as possible, so I'd like to have all that information. Thank you, Mr. Koretz, for that. Uh, Mr. Park. Yes. Let me just ask, uh, Jaime, on, the, on your personnel that are here today, are they on duty or off duty? Excuse me? Are the personnel here that work for you here on duty or off duty? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I think we need to find out if they're here testifying, if they're here off duty, on duty. If they're here on off duty, do you have a requirement as to how they come in uniform if they're off duty and what duties they can perform? Yes, Council Member, we do. Okay. And we are investigating it currently. Thank you. The other thing I'd like to find out is that what is the dollar figure that the budget put in for the uh, revenue for the part-time? Uh, so say with just the part-time program? Yes. It would be a, a net of $9 million. $9 million. Yes. The other thing is that on uh, part, and Chief, you would be best to answer this, is that on part-timers or new employees that are full-time, do they come, either one of them come with a full knowledge of the operation of the city? No, sir. So they all, they learn it uh, in play? Yes, Council Member, that's correct. So even if you're full-time, you come often without knowledge of who your councilman is or what the issues are that reflect on the city? Yes, Councilman, that's so have, correct. So you have to learn that? That's correct. The other thing I'd like to know is, is personnel here? Let me just ask the personnel, where are we on the hiring process? 
and when do we think we'll reach the goal of 100 people? We've completed the um, Gloria Sosa, Assistant General Manager at Personnel Department. Um, we've completed the uh, hiring of 47 part-time uh, traffic officers that I believe will begin the training program next week. That's correct. On Monday. Monday. Okay, then what about the remaining? The remaining positions will be um, filled through um, the next civil service exam. Mm -hmm. And that process, as far as the civil service exam, um, the department is currently reviewing the requirements. And when they forward their uh, changes to the requirements, we'll begin that process. And we expect to have an eligible list available for hiring in four months. Okay. Let me ask you, I mean, what are we reviewing on requirements? Because these positions have been around for 25 years at least. So, what, what, I mean, the four months, I thought when we did the budget, we were told that the uh, personnel part would be escalated during May and June so that we would be able to seamlessly go from one list to another and get this hundred in hand because the longer we wait, the less chance we have at retrieving the $9 million. Yeah. yeah, I think that was the intention. We did start the process early. I think you saw in the memo that we actually had 230 people on the eligible list. I think we were a little bit surprised that, you know, not more of the people on the list actually wanted to be interviewed. And then we've been going through background screening as well to make sure that we're getting quality candidates. You know, there have been instances where, you know, the backgrounds were not acceptable to me as general manager, nor to Commander Mike Williams, and you know, some of the candidates were rejected. You know, we're trying to definitely you know, make sure that this remains a professional organization within the department and that we adhere to the highest standards. Okay. There's two things I'd like to ask you to do, is that if you can ensure that those who didn't respond, if we can recontact them, those who failed the background, I think, speaks for themselves. Uh, the other issue is that if we can reduce that four-month period as much as we can so that we can uh, met, uh, meet that 100 requirement as quickly as we can. Uh, because I think what many people may be missing, if you do not hit the $9 million mark, that's a hole in the budget that may mean later on people could be laid off or, uh, or more furloughs or a lot of things. So the $9 million is in the budget and has already been allocated. Uh, before we've written one ticket. So we really need not to slow down or to be late on that goal. So if we can get those two things, I'd appreciate it. Yes, and we've been working at the personnel department, and they've been very helpful and cooperative in that process. So we'll continue to work with them, try to accelerate this. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Uh, Mr. LaBange. Okay, so the uh, receive and file is, is the Mr. Rosendahl, necessary. I have Please, one other Mr. question. Kratz, of course. Um, since we're looking at uh, a $9 billion hole we have to fill, and since full time officers also bring in more than their salary, would we not be capable of hiring enough full time officers that it also would bring in the $9 million in revenue? I mean, I think conceptually, yes, that would be a change in policy direction from the <laughs> council mayor. Generally speaking, I'll defer to the CA on the specific numbers. We would have to hire more full-time officers to generate the same net revenue. Okay. Let me comment on that. I think what we found in the, in the budget hearings and the reason it was proposed is that although uh, offer for hour for hour you might have the same revenue, but on the part-times you're not paying the pension and the overhead, Right. Which correct. Is, uh, extensive. Correct. You, you're both council members. You're both correct. Mm -hmm. And um, the the incremental difference uh, with a full time officer is much less. So um, we might be able to achieve a, a gain in revenue through the hiring of full time officers, but their costs are significantly higher than a part time officer in comparison because of exactly that. The pensions no red. Costs. So it would eat into because the there's still revenue. a net gain, even when you take all those factors into account, um, it would seem mathematically impossible that you couldn't hire enough full-time officers to achieve the same revenue result. 
you know, on a conceptual basis, um, that would seem to be true, but at some point we are going to hit a point of saturation when it comes to actual citations. Um, and I don't know, I'd have to um, ask the department what their professional judgment is as to where that is, but I'm not sure if we've hit that yet or not. But once we do, it won't matter how many officers we hire, we will have essentially saturated the market on citations. So, Right. I, I, although I assume what we budgeted for would address that. The fact is we, we found ourselves short in the number of officers. Um, so originally, uh, I think we were short something like 50 full-time officers. So obviously we weren't anticipating hitting that saturation point. Uh, so we easily could hire 50 full-time officers. It would still be an appropriate level. Um, and we could uh, achieve the same revenue goals. You know, um, Council Member, I don't remember having any significant discussions on where that saturation point is. Um, if you, I, I don't those, recall I it either. I don't think we've had them. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I, from my point of view, I think we've just taken the easy way out and said let's do part-time officers and not pay them any pensions or benefits. Um, frankly, I think we could do that with a lot of the city and have the city almost entirely run by unbenefited, unpensioned part-time workers, you wouldn't have the same quality of work and you wouldn't be treating your employers, employees fairly, but one could do that. Uh, I think we're just headed in the wrong direction. Any further comments, colleagues? My only other comment is I don't know whether receive and file is the right motion since this also is, then gets referred to personnel. Just to receive and file for this committee. For this committee and then refer it to personnel. Okay. Uh, any other comments? So we will receive and file this from this committee and it will go to personnel committee. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much for that. Uh, item number four, we have nine cards and then we have over 20 cards for item number five. So we've got quite a bit of stuff to go through here, uh, folks. I'll so move a one minute, I'll move a one minute public comment. Um, the number of cards, Mr. Rosenthal. Uh, Ms. Labonge is suggesting one minute public comment at this point, colleagues. Is that a consensus of the group? It's fine. That's fine with Mr. Correa. Are we taking, excuse me, Mr. Chair, are we taking the items together or four, no, four? No, we're taking item four. Okay, let me just read. Item number four is a Kretz Rosendahl motion requesting the city attorney to prepare and present, or, uh, to prepare an ordinance prohibiting commercial vehicles from parking along Beverly Glen um, from Wilshire Boulevard to Comstock Avenue. Okay, and colleagues, uh, we've said one minute, I think, as a group, and that's basically because we have nine cards and another 20 cards, um, and uh, um, Mr. Parks is leaving us at 3.30, uh, and we do want to keep him here as long as we can. Okay, so that's item number four. Do, do we need a, a staff quick uh, comment on what this is? Requesting the city attorney prepare an ordinance prohibiting commercial vehicles from parking along Beverly Glen Boulevard from Wilshire Boulevard to Comstack Monday through Friday. That's self-explanatory, one, one would think. Okay. So why don't we go to public comments? Uh, Eric Glenn, Sandy Brown, uh, Stephen. I'm sorry. I, I think it's Resnick. I'm not sure. You'll pass. Okay. Uh, David um, Kleinman, come on up. Uh, Matt Geller, you're going to pass? Okay. Uh, then there is a Lee Ross. And then we do have Christopher McKinney waiting, and, and I think it's Michelle Grant, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sorry. Well, you're item four on here, no? Oh, no, it's fine. Okay, well then I'll put you in item five. Okay. Please, sir. If it's okay, I'll I'm going to start. Fine. She wants me to start. It's okay. Um, Sandy Brown, for the record, um, president of Homeby Westwood Property Owners Association, in which this portion of uh, Beverly Glen is located. We have been working on this issue for several years now. Um, we have a big uh, safety issue on Beverly Glen. As you know, we're getting a lot of traffic over the hill. Um, now that they're, especially now since the freeway problem is ongoing, um, cars travel quickly and we have a tremendous problem with parking of large vehicles and causing 
um, accidents on the street. I gave each of you um, several uh, pictures of what has been going on on Beverly Glen um, during this time. Uh, we're asking for a motion to, to restrict parking for commercial vehicles on Wilshire between, uh, on Com Beverly Glen between Wilshire and Comstock, which is really half of the area approximately between there and Sunset Boulevard. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Next, state your name for the record. Uh, David Kleiman, and I'm a resident that lives on Beverly Glen. I've uh, been there 17 years. I've got um, teenagers that try to get in and out of our driveway. My daughter's been in an accident. Um, coming out of the driveway. It's, it's consistently an unsafe situation. You can't see north, you can't see south when there are oversized vehicles parked on Beverly Glen. We also have, uh, because of the proximity to Wilshire Boulevard, we have um, the 18-wheel trucks that carry other cars. They load and unload in the center divider um, other cars. So we've got, uh, we've got delivery vehicles, we've got catering trucks, we've got oversized vehicles, we've got um, cars unloading, it, it's just be, become 17 years ago when I moved in there, it was nothing like it is today. It's just become a situation where it's intolerable. And we do have a book that uh, has pictures and information that's going around and a petition that uh, we'd like you to take a look at. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leah Ross with the Border Grill Truck and Border Grill Restaurants. Um, from what I understand, this area has had issues for a long time, and I'm not disputing that. I just am particularly looking at something within the motion that says an exception can be made to allow for delivery trucks to drop off items or for construction repair work. And um, what I would like to see is if this uh, motion becomes a template for similar motions in other parts of the city, that there be another exception. Uh, allowing for a catering truck or a food truck that has been hired by a business or a homeowner for a specific event like a special event like a birthday. Ideally, uh, for something like that, we would park on the, on the person's property in their driveway. But if that's not possible, um, this motion would limit our ability to do business there. Thank you for your comment. Please. Hi, I'm Erin Glenn, um, representing the Asociación de Loncheros, and the Loncheros are the traditional catering food trucks that are uh, typically seen in um, different parts of the city, but some of them in Beverly Glen, and they have been the source of some of the, um, or have provoked some of the um, situations in the neighborhood. And so in theory, I think that this motion um, is acceptable because it, it doesn't restrict catering trucks from being in the area, um, I think if they can just, uh, you know, keep uh, regulate that that part of the street, I think that it would be fine. I would not like to see it extend any farther, uh, because there is a huge need for food trucks um, in that part of the area. I mean, there are domestic workers, there are gardeners, there are other kinds of uh, workers that um, have go and eat lunch at these trucks, and I think that they provide a very valuable service. Okay, thank you for that comment as well. Uh, there's one more gentleman, right? Am I right about that? They all called. They all got them all. Next uh, call. Stefan, did you speak? I've already spoken. No, no. Everybody spoke. Okay, good. Um, does the staff want to respond, uh, or um, Mr. Caress, do you want to say anything? Um, I just say this has been an ongoing problem for, for a very extended period of time. I think it's uh, a safety hazard for the residents in, in my district in this area. And uh, I'd like uh, for us to, to move this item as it's written. Any other comments, uh, colleagues? And also, uh, I think technically it should be done as a resolution rather than an ordinance. Under 22507 of the California Vehicle Code, you can do it as either an ordinance or a resolution. Do you prefer a resolution? I think that makes more sense. And Mr. Levine. Uh, I agree with the right. councilman of the district. If he feels this is a safety impact, yes, a safety impact. I heard from the one person of his family moving in and out. Uh, safety is the number one concern here. So I would support Mr. Caretz. So I would, if that, if that's the action, then we would uh, recommend that you direct the department to prepare the necessary resolution to. Um, to implement this district as described in the motion. Or uh, as working with the city attorney's okay, office and the department. The ordinance and resolution. 
kids might not know. The, uh, you can do either under. It's, it's just an easier, faster process sometimes to do a resolution as opposed to an ordinance. An ordinance has more uh, formal things that you have to, steps to go through. It, it, it will be implemented much faster. Is that it? Any other comments? Okay. Uh, so moved uh, unanimous by the committee. Thank you. Okay. That is um, item number four. Uh, now we have um, item number five. But, Mr. Parks, you wanted to speak on item number six before uh, yeah. you leave. Yes. And we do have one card on item number six. So could I ask uh, uh, Sun Young Yang to come on up? Let me just mention item number six is the DOT report relative to the reprogramming of $7.5 million in Prop C for the Wilshire Bus Rapid Transit Project. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Um, I uh, I got news that um, this was going to be finalized, and I'm, I'm not here to, you know, raise any concerns. I'm just um, here to thank uh, the city council and specifically the transportation committee for having um, really moved this project forward. And now it's in the final stages, so I just support the motion and um, hope that the Bussoni Lane will be running soon after the construction is done. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Mr. Parks. Yeah. I'd just like to ask um, the uh, DOT to come up. Just I have a couple of questions. I remember this is the item that we recently uh, debated how long the line should be. The one, the one concern I have, and I, I'm trying to follow the money as it relates to dis, uh, uh, disassembling one project and moving towards another. And I, the one major issue I have is why is the uh, local money of the 700000 no longer eligible as matching, or why are we substituting Prop C when at least last year we were told Prop C was in dire need of infusion, in fact, a number of cutbacks? Um, good afternoon. My name is Kang Hu. I'm senior transportation engineer in LADOT. A reason why uh, we use Prop C funds to uh, swap the uh, west side uh, mitigation fund is number one, the Westside Mitigation Fund is running very low, and this is a regional project, so we feel proxy is more appropriate. But more importantly, uh, it's because we have identified accounts in C that have already been allocated for Wilshire BRT project, and uh, uh, there are three um, accounts that we have identified as shown in the uh, page number two of your report. Um, two of the three accounts the money have already been uh, spent, and we want to take credit for those expenditures uh, that can be accounted for the local match. So in a way, we're saving the city. Um, the, the first account is $417,000, and the second account was $83,000. So altogether, it's about $500,000 the city already spent. And that- I understand that totally. I'm just trying to figure out with all of the maneuvering, and I see how you're getting prophecy and whatever, why are we taking out the 700,000 local funds and replacing it with Prop C when we've been told Prop C is in, also in danger of being very low and in deficit? Uh, we understand Prop C is pretty tight, but this proposal before you does not tap into additional Prop C funds. These are the funds that have already been allocate and some of them already spent. All right, then, then what you're telling me, if I understand it, that the 700000 that has been put back into the local West L.A. fund is no longer needed. The 700000 or, or did we replace it with another fund? It was never taken out. Yeah. It was never actually taken out at... Um, Prop C, Prop C money was used to advance the front funding for the original 2001 call project. So we never we never drew from the 700,000. Okay, then why are we saying on the report today that it's no longer eligible and we're identifying 700,000? And you got to explain that. Well, the original call project requires 700,000 from Westwood Regional Fund, yeah. and that fund no longer exists. That fund is folded into the West LA uh, traffic right. mitigation fund. And um, so we're saying that the West Wood Regional Fund is no longer available. That's what we're saying. Yeah. Okay. If it was merged into another fund, why yes. is it no longer available? 
was merged into the West LA mitigation fund, that fund is running pretty low. Uh, what does that mean? What's the reason? What does that mean? It's running. Some districts have no mitigation funds. I mean, so what, what do you mean it's running pretty low? Um, several months ago, the city council approved uh, the allocation of $5 million to pay for the um, exposition and support the great separation. Uh, that pretty much depleted the West LA mitigation fund. And there's still some money there, but it's not. But that was a decision made by the council district to have a great separation that wasn't funded by the expo line. That's correct. Okay. And so in order to get that, it had to be funded, and they funded it out of their local money. So I'm still trying to figure out, being that Prop C is low, why did it take precedent over a local fund that is also low? Well, there was, um, I believe there's $15 million identified in the Transportation Grant Fund work program for local match for federal funded projects. This money that we're recommending, the 700000 is coming out of that $15 million that's already identified for this purpose, for Wilshire specifically. You're still not answering my question. <coughs> there were 700000 local funds. You took it out and changed it with Prop C. Why did we make that decision? Particularly when we've been told Prop C is very low. In fact, we made several changes last year because it was in deficit. Well, Councilman, the, the main reason is because that $700,000 was part of the Comstock to Selby Wisher widening project. And that project, the widening portion is no longer part of the Wisher BRT project. And so um, the, the Wisher BRT, it turns out to be a regional project now. So using a local uh, area fund uh, is not as appropriate as using the a regional um, proxy funds. Because you know, it goes through a couple of council districts. Why is it regional? Well, it's a regional significant project uh, for the city of Los Angeles. Yeah. What's the definition of regional? It starts in Westlake and it goes to the Santa Monica city limit. Pardon? It starts in the Westlake area and goes to the Santa it's Monica city limit. Several council districts. That's correct. Is that the reason it's regional? Well, you can say that, yes. Citywide. Yeah. I didn't want to say it. I'm asking you later. I'm asking you what is the definition of regional? Well, it traverse through uh, a majority of the, the west side to the mid, middle of uh, Los Angeles and come to downtown. So it, it is a regional project in nature. Yeah. I've exhausted myself. I don't know if I exhausted my questions. He's exhausted himself. Right, here's what I want you to do. A region is an area like from the Westlake Community Plan District to the Brentwood Community Plan District and in between in that corridor. That is what a regional effort is. The, the Crenshaw line would be a regional effort because it connects Crenshaw with the airport. So if you could explain it as I just did to Mr. Parks, I think it would be helpful. That's what the reason. Use your hands, Westlake, <laughs> West L.A., <laughs> Well, we're looking at serving, you know, approximately 75,000 to 100,000 bus riders a day with the Wilshire Bus Rapid Transit Project that extends from Santa Monica City Limit all the way into uh, Parkview Avenue in the West Lake District. And the line even goes east all the way to Commerce. The 725, 725 is the busiest it. bus in the United States outside of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So that's why they said regional. Exactly. And I was just to help my good so friend. So outside of Beverly Park. Hills, we have a we have a bus lane project that the FTA has declared as regionally significant. Okay, um, okay, Mr. Parks is leaving. Uh, we're moving forward with this motion, Mr. Goretz, and uh, we have unanimous support here. Okay, okay. Hey, Mr. Parks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Parks is leaving us. We're now to three member committee. Thank you. Uh, and, and we've taken the action on this, which is to approve the report. Approve the recommendations that are outlined in the report. There are multiple to make the fund transfers. Correct. Thank you. Okay. And now, now we're down to item number five. 
Item number five is a Rosendahl-Kretz motion instructing DOT to report relative to the steps necessary to implement the California Vehicle Code exemption to allow residents to legally park in front of their driveways. Okay, staff, would you come up real quickly and, and put a couple of sentences together on this I one? Think, Mr. I, Chair, I think the city attorney needs to make a few statements. To make a few comments oh, please first. do. Go for it. Uh, as you're well aware, council members, this matter is in litigation, uh, not parking in front of driveways, which has been on the agenda for today. But if you're going to discuss apron parking, that matter is in litigation. I'm advising council that they please do not speak on that matter. It, based on the allegations in the complaint, it's just something that you would be ill-advised to speak on. Obviously, there are people here who can come up and talk about the necessity of parking in front of their driveways under 22507.2 of the California Vehicle Code. But because the matter is in litigation and because of the way it's on the agenda today, that's really what you're limited to, to discussing under the Brown Act. Okay. And what I would suggest to Council is that, that it do not request reports from the Department regarding apron parking because those will be attorney-client privilege documents because they will be preparing the information that you would necessarily need as part of a work product for the city attorney's office and the private firm that's representing the city in the litigation. What I would suggest is that you request at the next session a closed session so that you can be briefed on the litigation by the outside counsel that's representing the city and to advise you as to what you may discuss in open session if you decide to calendar this at a future meeting so that you can discuss apron parking. But otherwise, it's a multi-million dollar lawsuit, and you'd be ill-advised to discuss it in uh, open session. Okay, and remember, what we're action for today is to report back to the committee. Uh, it says 30 days, but we'll be on recess, so that would be in the fall after that, right, Maria? Okay. Uh, but uh, just in the general context of things, I, I have mentioned to the traffic control and, and to uh, the department head that I've gotten a significant amount of homeowners outraged uh, on sunset in the Palisades uh, for ticketings that took place after 20 years, people and their homeowners and their neighborhoods and their easements between sunset and public uh, walkway, that all of a sudden a whole bunch of tickets uh, have come up uh, over, the, over the blue and, and people have no idea what it's all about. And I've asked the department uh, manager to look into this. Uh, uh, is he still in the room? Yeah. Make sure you take this particular uh, email uh, from Hash Gandhi, uh, one, one of the constituents in the Palisades uh, that is very upset uh, with what's happening in different parts. I've also gotten calls over the weekend from Venetians and so on and so forth on similar issues like that. Okay, folks, we got a whole bunch of cards here um, uh, on this item number five. Christopher McKinnon. Um, Roxanne uh, Stern, uh, Margaret um, Buchet. Oh, sorry about that. Come on up. Um, uh, Cassie uh, Raymond Anderson. Okay, that's the first four, uh, and then we'll just move along after that. Uh, you can start, ma'am, first with your name for the record. Okay, my name is Margaret Buchheit. I've lived on Beverly Glen for 13 years. And we thank you very much for, for your motion. It won't help us there because of the configuration of our garages. Um, we were going to discuss the issue that the city attorney says we can't. We can't discuss our problems either with it. What you can discuss under two, under 22500 E, it's illegal to park under state law in front of a driveway. There is an exception under 22507.2 of the California Vehicle Code that the city can enact a local ordinance and through a permit that only the owner or a lessee mm -hmm. can use will be authorized to park in front of the driveway. Now, the only thing you can really discuss, because that is the only thing that was on the agenda today, is the need in your neighborhood for parking in front of a driveway. I can't. But not in the apron. But not the apron, no. It's, can we, it's not it's under the Brown Act. It would be beyond the scope. But of let me just say this. Uh, uh, you're the public. You can say what you want. City attorney is directing that at us okay. elected officials here. No one can tell you okay. what to say. We have a big problem in that we've, we've depended on the parking. As you know, our area is concentrated with people. 
tell him. And and it wasn't, the, you know, our, our buildings weren't built in a time when there were a lot of, there was a lot of need for as much parking as there is now. And we really need your help in resolving this issue and maybe ask that it be referred to the city attorney's office so that he can explore maybe some possibilities for us. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Good afternoon. Roxanne Stern. Uh, I live in North Village. I've been a resident for 13 years. I basically, you just destroyed what I was going to say. So I will throw this out, that if you talk to the litigants in this suit, they will all agree that if the car is not parked on the sidewalk, they do not have an issue with it. You can talk to the lawyers. You can talk to the litigants. And so we should be able to have, if uh, we are against parking on the sidewalk. Now, in Patrick, go ahead and try, get ticket, everybody who's on the sidewalk. But let us have the apron parking. It is a, such a handicap in, in, in North Village. We chose this area because it was, look, it was in the <coughs> city and it was beautiful. And we peacefully coexist with our student neighbors. <coughs> but we live next to one of the largest university in California. And there are, we have issues that are not in any other neighborhood. We really need to protect our, everybody here. There are real hardships that are going on. We need laws. We need you to make the laws and help us get get it. Right now, it's a lose-lose. If you make some changes, it will be a win for everybody. Thank you. Appreciate that articulation there. Ma'am. My name is Cassie Ramsey Anderson. My husband's family is all the apartments along the South Beverly Glen. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, we've owned our place since 1973. We're right on South Beverly Glen. We're directly hit by this ticketing because uh, it's tantamount to taking your child's hand if we have to cross the street now because we have less parking than we ever did. Uh, the street parking as it is is taken up by Century City employees. You know, we can't park on the street. We can't move. Most of us have at least two cars. Everyone in L.A. does. You know, families have two cars. Some have four. Some have three. Uh, we rent out apartments to people who, you know, based on having garage and apron parking, it's always been that way. I know the law has been on the books for years. It's never been enforced until now. And what we were confused about, and everyone was walking around shell-shocked the day we all got these tickets, was that this warning wasn't clear. You know, we didn't realize, you know, about this whole issue with UCLA and, 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 cross, and blocking sidewalks. My point, to make it short, is that we don't block sidewalks. We don't block the streets. We have plenty of apron parking in front and behind our cars, so we don't even block what traffic sees. The biggest issue I see now that we have to walk to our cars, blocks through our neighborhoods, is that Beverly Glen, as mentioned in the case before ours, is, is like a tantamount to a freeway now. People are going, and this is backed by the uh, LAPD has told us that they pluck people going 90 miles an hour past our houses. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate okay. your comments. Sir, name for the record. Christopher McKinnon from Mar Vista, CD11, uh, unofficially representing 200 uh, residents that have large and long aprons, and the city attorney's rep just stole our thunder and said we couldn't talk about it, but councilman said we could. So um, is there somewhere we could read the litigation online or so that we know? Good. Can, can they get can give us the – where it's a court document. I don't personally have a site right now, but we can uh, – make the site probably available through council's office. Yes, whatever you can make it available records. so people can have access it within the law, uh, right. it would be helpful for the, for the folks to understand. Because um, we're talking about long aprons, not sidewalks, and uh, uh, parking in front of our driveways. So I want to read into the record my uh, amendment to Los Angeles Municipal Code, which I believe would fall under and be approved under section – can I yeah, go ask ahead. for another minute? Uh, I'll let the lady speak a little bit longer so you can turn. Los Angeles Municipal Code, Chapter 8, Traffic Section 80, Division N, Parking Prohibited or Limited, Section 80.53, Standing in Parkways Prohibited. No person shall stop, stand, or park a vehicle within any parkway. My amendment, which I hope the committee and the full council would take up at the appropriate time when city attorney says they can, Except in a permitted driveway apron whose length is such that the vehicle stop standing or parked does not encroach on the sidewalk or the street, including the convenience strip. 
And I go on in this to explain. What I'd like you to do, please, is share that with the city attorney offline later so that he can at least be empowered enough to understand what we're talking about here on this particular issue. And we'll bring it back to committee at another point. So I'll give it to him now? Yes. Thank you very much. And then we have Stephen Resnick, Susan Lieberman, Flint Dill, and Richard Greenberg. Okay, Stephen Resnick. Okay, Susan Lieberman. Is it Flint Dill? Dilly, yeah. Dilly. Uh, Richard Greenberg. Okay, great. You can start with you, please. No, go ahead. You're right there. You're at the corner. Oh, me? <laughs> Sorry, I thought <laughs> right. Paul last. Yeah, my name is Flint Dilly. I, I've lived in the North Village. Uh, for, sorry, am I talking to that? Yeah. Uh, um, for uh, 25 years now, we've had this issue come up before. You know, uh, the first time Zev Yaroslavsky fixed it for us uh, when the the new parking, you know, the the new parking guys and the little machines came in, and he fixed it for us. How did he uh, fix it for you? Oh, we just went into his office and they stopped giving us tickets. So we thought it, we thought it was done. Then, Councilmember, <laughs> I once again yeah, I, remind I understand you that you're right. in litigation. Yeah. Then, uh, then, uh, yeah, we had a similar thing. Jack Weiss came in about three years ago and fixed it for us again. We thought it was going through committee, it was taken care of, and it turned out it was a banana peel. I understand what my city attorney is talking about. <laughs> yeah, what? Well, and uh, yeah, he and you know. Uh, it was, that was, we thought fixed. Sorry, I'm, I'm down to four seconds. I, I, I can go on. It's amusing. I mean, okay. you know. well, thank you, sir. I appreciate your comments. Sure. Ma'am. Yeah, I had prepared a whole speech. We took time off. From your work. name, please. Susan Lieberman. Go ahead, Susan. Uh, I, I, I also live near UCLA. I, I would just say that this is a system that had worked for decades. All of a sudden, it's being pulled out from under us. Um, at the same time, UCLA is, has embarked on a big construction plan. They are exempt from city codes. They're, they have no alternatives that they've offered for the students. It's very difficult right now. It'll be even worse in the fall when the students come back. Uh, we need to have common sense here, ticket those who block the sidewalks, bring back apron parking, it's as simple as that. This lawsuit is bogus. It was brought by, it was promoted by UCLA professors. It, it's, it's more of a hardship to people who have handicap issues that uh, come to visit us. They can't park their by. There I go. You can finish your sentence, ma'am. <laughs> well, I was going to say, um, you know, we, we have uh, handicap visitors who come. Um, someone else is going to be speaking on that. Um, and if they have, they have difficulty finding places to park to even get to us now, it, 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 whereas before they used to park right there in front of our house. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah. Hello, Richard Greenberg, uh, resident on the Beverly Glen Freeway south of Santa Monica. <clears throat> um, while I appreciate the litigation that's going on, I am in support of the motion of parking in front of the driveway uh, perpendicular to the driveway. However, I believe that we absolutely need to address this other issue. Since the uh, LAMC and the state code have both had laws regarding aprons for the last however many years and chosen not to ticket, I don't see why this is in litigation. Uh, we cannot choose not to ticket now if we're not blocking sidewalks. Uh, maybe that's something that the council can uh, suggest. My 80-year-old mother has trouble walking six blocks to the parked car. My five-month pregnant uh, wife has <laughs> trouble walking. My upstairs tenants who have a two-year-old daughter, uh, also the same trouble. So this is a huge issue for us. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Resnick, Secretary of the uh, Westwood Neighborhood Council. And I'd, uh, the council at a recent board meeting passed this uh, resolution unanimously. Whereas the North Village faces chronic parking shortages already, and whereas many students have off-campus jobs beyond easy reach of public transportation, and whereas orderly apron parking in the North Village doesn't interfere with pedestrian and street traffic, 
and whereas a parking enforcement policy should be established to keep sidewalks and streets free of parking encroachments, therefore the Westwood Neighborhood Council <coughs> calls on Council Member Paul Koretz and City Attorney uh, Carmen A. Trutanich to protect resident parking rights while still keeping sidewalks accessible for all residents of Los Angeles. I would only add that my other hat as president of the Westwood Homeowners Association, the apron parking uh, issue is not only in the village, but on Beverly Glen. And, and it's wrong to, uh, after all these years, just to start ticketing people. And I appreciate your remarks, uh, uh, Council Member Rosendahl, to look into this and your motion also, uh, Council Member Koretz. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. I appreciate everybody's <laughs> comments. And now we have Haldis Koppel uh, coming in. Yeah. We have Christine. Uh, what? H. Uh, Luetti Fleck. I apologize for the mispronunciation. Barbara, uh, is it Brody? There she is. Uh, and then we have Philip Friedman. Thank you. Philip Friedman. I don't hear it very much. <laughs> okay, these are the next four folks. Uh, and we'll just start with you, ma'am, please. Hi. My name is Christine Lucci Fleck, and what do you, you want to hold this? Slide? This is two sided. Um, I emailed all of you today pictures taken from Google of a lot of the uh, situations we have in our older buildings with dual parking. We call it tandem parking, parking in the driveway and parking on the apron. Um, I also did a shot so you could see how incredibly long Beverly Glen is if you had to walk the entire span and halfway back to find a parking spot of which there are probably only 25 or 30, which are filled up by Century City employees during the day and half the night. The other slide here is a picture of my daughter. She's seven years old, and she goes to Westwood Charter. She's going to be in second grade. And we have a funny phrase that we use when we have to cross Beverly Glen, which we have probably done only a couple of times. We call it Frogger. And that's an old video game where you would try to go across the pond or the street and not get hit by the item that was after you. And those are the cars on Beverly Glen. We call it Beverly Glen Freeway also. Thank you for your time. And this is a very severe, urgent issue, a life-threatening issue on Beverly Glen. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Sarah. Uh, my name is Phil Friedman. I'm a resident of the North Village, have been for over a dozen years, and a resident of the greater Westwood area for over 50 years. And this is the first time I've ever come before the city council or any other organization. So you can imagine, I'm pretty mad. Uh, first of all, I want to thank I want to thank you for bringing this motion to the transportation committee. Uh, I want to believe it was done with the idea that it would assist the parking situation in our city. That's right. However, due to the nature of the parking environment in the North Village, that is simply not the case. Uh, driveway parking works for single-family residences. But in the North Village, we do not have a single, single family residence. In other words, the motion was well in intended, but misdirected as far as the North Village is concerned. So I'm, ex I'm speaking against the uh, motion as it's currently worded. But more importantly, I want to bring to your attention, as has been done previously, uh, apron parking was effectively eliminated in the North Village by enforcing, by authorizing enforcement of no apron parking. That was done just about a month ago. And it's interesting that was a coincidence shortly after all the UCLA students went away for summer vacation. Interesting. Uh, this came I about. Think Fev was responsible for that because he's a Bruin. Said him? <laughs> I was just thinking, Zev. Zev. Okay, I just had to say that for the good supervisor. We're trying to get a smile out of him. <laughs> Here's another Bruin. So we're, we're, all, we're all together on that. Um, Again, it was noted that decades of non-enforcement has taken place. It's been a precedent, a historical pre precedent. And uh, we want to say that uh, this uh, lack of en uh, enforcement created effectively almost 200 parking places. And when we started enforcing, they went away overnight. Uh, and it, that means that there's no parking for family members, roommates, visitors, service providers, etc. Uh, that were, were before we had some. And uh, the quality of life as a resident changed abruptly and dramatically worse. It has an extraordinary impact. Uh, 
I can only tell you this is a short fuse. You got to get this fixed really quickly because when the students come back, it's going to be incendiary, incendiary. Uh, there have been uh, concerns raised with our apron parking about blocking the sidewalks. You've already heard that uh, that's not an issue. That's a red herring. And we agree and, and support that any car that extends into the sidewalk should be ticketed and or towed. So we urge you to amend your motion to provide an exemption to restore apron parking in the North Village once and for all, Councilman. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate thank your you. comments. Uh, uh, and we gave you another minute and a half just because of your energy coming in the room. Uh, I want you to know, just historically, this motion that I put in yes. had to do with uh, parking in your driveway from Playa del Rey residents who have had trouble. The irony of your situation uh, just flew itself into a motion that had nothing to do, obviously, with what's going on in Westwood Village, as well as issues in my district in the Palisades Absolutely. and Venice and other places that have just experienced what your anger brought you to this meeting yep. as well. So yep. I appreciate your comments. Uh, Barbara. Thank you, Chairman Rosendahl. My name is Barbara Brody. I'm here as president of Westwood South of Santa Monica Boulevard Homeowners Association. However, I've learned that this issue is citywide. We have people here from all over. Plan check meeting last month, people in southeast L.A. all over. I'm here to support the rosendahl Coretz motion to allow for driveway adjacent parking as a tool to manage local parking issues. However, this measure does not completely solve the parking crisis created in our community as a result of a newly enforced citywide ban on apron parking that we're not supposed to discuss as a result of ADA litigation. Local residents are here to explain some of those negative impacts, including diminished handicapped access, diminished residential access, and serious safety concerns. While we clearly understand and agree with vigorous enforcement where access is impaired and where vehicles encroach onto sidewalks, that is not the case in our area. No one in the city has been able to explain to any of us why a ban on apron parking is being enforced when there is no encroachment. And we would appreciate if your committee could request of the city attorney an answer to that question and also that the city attorney's office draft possible options available to this committee and the council so that apron parking can be implemented and be in compliance with ADA requirements. We believe there should be options. We need it to protect our affordable housing for community safety and also so that different communities can fashion local districts that respond to their needs. We have business districts near us. I was told the solution to our pro problem is to have our residential district change from a one or two hour district to no parking in the day, which would then have a horrible impact on the business okay. community. Thank you for your comments. Um, Mr. City Attorney, I know it's not appropriate, but I'm just going to be the simple guy I am. Uh, her point about putting together a motion or doing a, a, a some, is that something we can appropriately discuss in this committee meeting? Uh, to, today we can discuss uh, parking in front of driveways, which is currently under state law. You're allowed to do it if, we, if they enact a local ordinance. Correct. That's the item that's on the agenda today. Are they not allowed to amend their motion, or their, or to amend their? This, the matter is currently in litigation, yes. ma'am. This is. But I understand right. it, but let, let me just ask you this, because this is a, a healthy discussion here. Um, in my district and in Mr. Caretz's district, out of the blue, the apron parking has had tickets given were never in the past. Had and no warning. I have two tickets. I, right, right. I know all this. <laughs> I, I'm just, I, but I don't want to take it. I just want to ask him as an attorney here the role. Can we, can Mr. Koretz and I say addend a motion and talk about apron parking, or do we need to schedule it for the next uh, transportation committee meeting? You need to schedule it for the next transportation committee. I, I would advise okay. you, you really need to discuss in closed session with the outside council representing the city. They can advise you. What so you, what you safely and can discuss with? Okay, because because my point is this further. I don't want traffic officers going out there ticketing people who for 20 years have been in those aprons with no safety issues and no inconvenience issues for anybody. And I just want to know legally, even though we're in litigation. 
can Mr. Koretz, and I haven't even talked to Mr. Koretz about this, put a motion in and say we want to bring this back, we want a moratorium on ticketing people like this until we have a closed-door discussion and a public discussion? Can we do that? No. We're not blocking driveways. We're not blocking driveways. Right now there's a current ordinance, city ordinance 80.53, which prohibits parking at all in parkways. So I understand. It's a dumb law. I'm not going to comment on what the law is. Right now you're prohibiting it. Well, no, I'm just talking in the context of the reality that we're experiencing here. And my understanding is that most of these tickets to date have been issued not because you're parked in an apron, but because you're parked on a sidewalk. No. 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 All right. Stop, stop, folks. Calm down. Mr. LeBron. Mr. Nagel is a very good city attorney. He solved the problem in my district, which was happening. What I want to ask the city attorney and the CLA, this is a very urgent problem, and the UCLA will open its fall quarter in a short week, which will have a giant impact. Can we waive this right into the city council? Can we have a hearing? We have to have a briefing executive session, if you call it, right away and just get it to the floor of the council with some suggestions after we're briefed. State law does not prohibit apron parking. Wait a second. Wait a second. The sergeant will come and get you. I don't want him to do that. I know. Yeah, I know. But it's no fun at county jail. Okay. CLA. I'm going to refer to the city attorney. City attorney, I'm going to get a motion to move this directly to city council to be briefed by the city attorney in front of the whole city council immediately so we could adjudicate what we feel is right for Los Angeles. You can introduce the motion in council on Friday. Okay. We can't just move this item in front of us right now. John, my city clerk, the motion you have before you, as Mr. Nagel has explained, is on the parking in front of the driveway. Right. And it's an entirely separate motion. Then a parking in the driveway. So what I would suggest, Mr. Chair, is if you draft a motion co-presented by Mr. Koretz and yourself, I will gladly second it to ask that all things considered in the enforcement by LADOT under sections, and I'm going to ask you, Mr. Nagel, to draft it so we do not put ourselves in a bad position to which we are in litigation, that the council be heard this matter at its earliest convenience in executive session so we can make a determination to move forward in the advent of school session and other complications that have said. When someone said about their mother who has to walk six blocks away and your child, it's all impactful. So that would get us into a form that we maybe could make some suggestions to deal with this situation. And we can play this out on Friday. But before we do, we've got a lot of people here. Let me just ask a question, Mr. Chair. Mr. City Attorney, you understand what I'm saying? So, okay. So I want to make it clear. We all understand it, and I think it's very good. Excellent. I'd love to ask the department head why all of a sudden we started ticketing these people. If you're able to talk without getting us into litigation. Mr. Chair, you're getting into the discussion about apron parking. We can't talk about that. We don't need. I'm just curious why all of a sudden it happened. You're up, Helen. Do we need to be there Friday, or is that in private session? No. We just put a motion in, and nothing happens Friday other than a motion goes in. And then it's scheduled for discussion after that. Please. My name is Haldis Topol. I'm here to represent the uh, Pacific Palisades Community Council with one hat and the uh, Marcus Mills Property Owners Association with the other. And I ask for some consideration just for a little bit of extra time. Maybe I can speak fast enough and make it in one minute. Um, I'm here to strictly and simply address the motion as written. Uh, to allow parking in front of a driveway. I am not aware that our community had a problem or has a problem with apron parking, and of course we're definitely against uh, blocking a sidewalk. So back to parking in front of a driveway. Um, I will combine both the MKPOA and PPCC positions uh, for simplification and uh, for sake of time. The uh, let me start, first of all, that a year ago we had problems. I had a complaint from a citizen that was ticketed parking in front of her own driveway. Outrageous. I thought it was terrible, bad law. Did some investigation, found out that Westwood uh, de facto has it approved because they were told that um, it wasn't enforced. So, of course, I marched to my board and said, hey, we're going to go to council office, love uh, Rosendahl Beerley, and ask for the same exemption. Uh, the board uh, went ballistic and said, no, we can't have this happen in our neighborhood. We're in the hillside. We have narrow streets. 
um, we have often no room for two cars to park, to, I'm sorry, pass simultaneously when both, um, both sides of the street are filled with parking. And the bottom line is when you allow dry, parking in front of a driveway, you take away the space in which a car can escape from an oncoming car, or not escape necessarily, but move out of the way of an oncoming car in a courtesy move, move potentially, number one. Number two, you take away the opportunity in long um, stretches of hillside road to make a U-turn, to take a driveway and turn, turn around. And thirdly, most importantly, you take away the space for emergency vehicles to pull into when there is a call, when an ambulance needs to come to your house and the space in front of your driveway is blocked. Uh, there's no way for the vehicle to, um, to be instead, you know, except in traffic. And on our streets, that may block the traffic period. Uh, it is a public safety issue. And if you move forward with a motion or consider moving forward with a motion, please consider taking uh, into consideration public safety, that is, police and fire, especially the fire department. Okay. And Thank we appreciate you. your comments and, and know that we're going to get a report back. We're taking no action on, on that today, but I appreciate your comments for the record. Thank you for your time. It's always a pleasure. Um, could we ask the next four to come up? And remember what Mr. Labanja suggested as a motion, and I have not spoken to Mr. Caress, but I saw a head nod over there, that we would probably be very open uh, to seeing how quickly we could move on this apron issue from the legislative standpoint, okay? But let's ask the following people. Krista uh, Shears to come up. Claudia, is that right? Sh uh, Claude. Claude. Sorry, Claude. That's okay. It's not the first time. Oh, Wolfgang. Uh, Vest Wolfgang, come on up. At least I got the Wolfgang right, right? Uh, Glenn Bailey, are you here, Glenn? Close enough. Glenn Bailey, going once. <clears throat> Glenn Bailey has left us. Uh, Christoph uh, Conrad. Oh, great. I got that name right, too. Okay. All right. Ghost. Hi, You're Claude up. Shires. Uh, I just want to say it's an honor and a privilege to be able to speak before you today. This is my first city council meeting and hopefully the first of many. My wife and I live at uh, the corner of Washington uh, Place and Marcusel, and uh, we bought the house in 2008, and it's almost insult to injury the fact that our home value has dropped in 40 percent since we moved there, and now this apron parking issue. I, I, I just want to say for the record, I totally approve of parking in front of the driveways, and now that issue has been somewhat exacerbated by the fact that we are also competing with a convalescent home and a psychiatric hospital for parking spaces of which the employees and visitors of these two facilities are often already clogging the streets with parking and now that we have to cross both Washington Place or Venice to um, to make it to back to our house after parking on subsequent Wednesday and Thursday <laughs> for street sweeping and um, on top of that we also have to maintain the parkway the grass the watering and all that stuff and for us you know not be able to park in front of it or in the apron is just absurd Thank you. thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. Ma'am. Hi, my name is Christina Shires. I just wanted to thank you for hearing us, Council, um, Councilman Rosendahl and Council members. Um, I just wanted to say that I agree with everything that my husband says. And just to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I Not just, everything. The city attorney was... Is that on record somewhere? <laughs> You're violating the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to add... Um, <laughs> that I'm a photographer, I'm an event photographer, I'm a wedding photographer, and oftentimes I, I come home from these events late at night, and since not being able to uh, park in our apron, I've had to park pretty far away, and I've had an episode where I've had a car stop me, a man asked me to get in his car. Um, the way our, the end of our street is, there's not a lot of houses because of these island homes, so I felt, you know, needless to say, pretty nervous, and... Um, and he parked, he left the area and then parked further down our street and asked me again to get in his car. I had all my equipment sure. with me. And it was just pretty terrifying. And, you know, for any other woman or man who has to park, you know, late at night, like, I just think it's a, a pretty uh, significant safety issue. Thank, Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Sir. I do understand that this motion is about parking in front of your driveway. That means peril to the curb. But uh, we have a different situation in North Village, where I've been a resident since 1969. That is 43 years. And in all those 43 years, it was common practice that you park perpendicular to the curb. Uh, we typically have uh, multifamily uh, residential housing there. 
and every apartment has basically a garage, a place behind the garage between the sidewalk and the garage, and then, of course, the apron parking. That has been tradition, has been used. It does not obstruct anybody who is using the sidewalk if properly enforced. It doesn't obstruct traffic because we have, besides parking on both sides of the street, we have two lanes in most of the streets. So that is not a problem. So I don't understand why one professor at UCLA uh, likes to use the ADA as a club to, uh, to basically push through his pet peeve about not allowing people to have cars. This is really unconscious. He's not even a resident. He's not affected by it. This should not be done. It has nothing to do with uh, ADA because no handicapped person should use the apron anyway because they cannot cross the street in the middle of a block. Plus, the biggest liability for the city is not the parking on the sidewalk. It is the broken sidewalks. You have to address that. You don't have the money. You're not willing to do that. I appreciate your comments. Thank so, you so much. Sir. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Christoph Conrad, and I live on 10966 Strathmore Drive, which is a 1930 complex with uh, three bedroom uh, condo and one parking space as of now. As of now. So um, I am a professor at West LA College and I uh, teach also uh, at various acting studios classes. But the bulk of my income comes from the private practice. And the private practice, which I pay having studio taxes for having studio in my house, uh, is being destroyed at this very moment. Because I have, until now, people coming and we can arrange the parking behind me or behind my neighbors, how we are structured. And I, right now, there's no possibility of parking. The business is totally destroyed. So I would like you to make this amendment or create such a, a law or uh, uh, to actually um, reinforce or return with the apron parking or some kind of situation that is actually going to work for us because right now I can't live and work at that place. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. We have two more. Uh, Jean uh, uh, Lewis uh, Rodriguez, I think, and Chuck uh, Dubon. Dubo. Dubo. Does anybody else here not or fill out a card that I didn't mention their name? Okay, these are the last two. Close enough, he says. Good for that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jean-Louis Rodrigue. I'm, uh, I'm in a unique situation. I am a professor at UCLA. I've been a prof professor there for 20 years. And, but I also, I also use my home to meet my students and other professors from other universities and, uh, and also the profession uh, outside. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to do that this past month. And uh, to me, that's very serious because it makes my job so much more limited. Uh, I have a letter from one of, the, of my clients. I'm going to read you this. Um, to, uh, this woman is uh, disabled. To my knowledge, there are no handicapped park parking spaces on his street, my street, or even in the general area. In addition, I would not even be able to park on another street and use my manual wheelchair to get to his studio because the greatest on Strathmore is much too steep. As you know, most of the neighborhood is situated on hills. I understand that allowing apron parking occasionally may cause sidewalks to be blocked by wheelchair access. However, that is only because of the very few people that do not follow the rules Forbidding apron parking will actually cause more difficulty for disabled people like myself who need to park as close as possible to the entrances. I urge you to consider that taking away the ability for the residents to park in apron will actually make it more difficult for a greater number of disabled people. I thank you uh, for listening to this. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your oh, comment. Just a technical question. What do you profess at UCLA? I teach theater. Theater, very good. Okay. Okay. Sarah. My name is Chuck Dubow. I bought a condominium in the North Village 36 years ago. It came with one carport and apron parking. 
and for decades prior to my purchase, because of the large number of cars that and short supply of parking spaces available, you could park on the apron and not receive a ticket unless you blocked the sidewalk. Two and a half years ago, I had a health event that required home health care and physical therapy several times a week for several weeks to help in my recovery. Today, with no apron parking, home health care for me is not an option anymore. Please return apron parking. And if I may make one more brief comment, I have read the lawsuit. And although I agree with some of the parts of it that Mr. Pena brings up, there's a lot of it that I won't comment on because I can't say anything nice about it. Okay, well, look, thank you all very much for coming in on item number five and, and for the democracy at its best. Uh, this was an experience my folks just had over the weekend, too. Uh, everybody did. And so we're going to draft something. I'm going to ask the department to help us in the drafting of this motion. Uh, many of us feel the, the exact frustration you guys do. And so this was a dynamic that was healthy for us all, and we will take further action. As, as Mr. LeBon suggested, Mr. Koretz and I will put a motion together, uh, and we'll get it uh, quickly in, into the process in the Council. In the meantime, we'll consult with the Department Head of how we move forward with it. And I appreciate everybody coming on this and, and making the democracy. Council, Mr. Chair, please, come on up with that. Wait a second. Board. Wait, folks. It's okay. Mr. Chair, I haven't had a chance to say a word on oh, this oh, whole Mr. subject. Mr. Koretz, I apologize. Go for it. Now, I'm not supposed to say much on the direct, direct subject, so I guess... He's sitting next to the lawyer. I'll start by I mean. saying it's good to see you in your apron parking yourself where you have. <laughs> um, uh, this, is, this is clearly a disastrous situation. Um, we can't say much about it. Uh, I will say, even though I shouldn't, that uh, DOT originally was going to begin in force the week before finals at UCLA. So that's my involvement so far, was trying to implement it at a rational time. Um, I think the motion today is, a, is an incredibly modest first step in the right direction. We clearly have to do more, and we have to do it fast, and we have to do it in closed session so we do it in the firmest legal footing without causing ourselves any headache and actually going in the wrong direction because of it. So hopefully we'll have a motion on Friday. We'll have a closed session as soon as possible to, to discuss it thereafter and hopefully craft something that, that's workable for the folks in the North Village and Beverly Glen and elsewhere in the city so that handicapped folks are protected and residents uh, who desperately need the parking are protected as well. And in the preamble of the motion, that's very good. And you're very active uh, uh, in the district, Paul, so it's great to serve with you that the preamble state that there was a robust public hearing that's right. where over 25 people came in voice okay. and unanimous, and unanimous you know what the word is, Mr. Unanimous City Attorney. Yeah, very good. Everybody said any enforcement on the sidewalk, impeding sidewalk, should be strictly enforced. And the ADA should be in compliance with that. But, and then the preamble, just to suggest it. And lastly, I know Ms. Brown is here, a veteran of many activities here, so this is not for you, Sandy, but if anybody's never been to City Hall before, I'll run them up to the tower and uh, give you a quick tour right after following this meeting. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I know it's technically you're not allowed to speak, but come to the mic and we'll let you fill out another card real quickly. I just wanted to ask about the motion of parking in front of the driveways on the street. Uh, is, does that mean that anybody can park in front of your driveway? No, it would only be the resident who's driveway. It would be there. permitted by house? Yes. What, under state law, only the owner or lessee is allowed to park in that spot. The, the spot, in fact, you cannot give that parking permit to anyone else. It has to be in the car that it's registered for and only used by the owner or the lessee. So and that house number on the permit that's correct. in front that's correct. of that and driveway the only. plate on the car for which of the, of the homeowner or the lessee. Okay. If you, you're going to be in big violation if you try to sell or use students to, you know. Can we also keep that in mind regarding yes. the apron thing? Of course. Yes. Well, Mr. Chair, can I might clarify? might be a way to move with that. Yeah. For, for the item that's before us right now on parking in front of driveways, you want to direct the department to come back with a report on the program to implement? Is that what we're, okay. That's right. Okay. And in additional, I just want to say the neighbor that I represent, the older part of the city, Mr. 
Rosendahl, at Silver Lake, and Harvard Valley Hills, and they don't have aprons, but they're short skirts. So uh, this would be impactful for people, too. So it does open up a wide number of issues. So when we do that discussion in closed session, we'll be able to. I like that very much. Uh, we like the skirts, too, as well as the aprons. Did One more comment. This is out of the rules. For, uh, it's for CD4 because he does have some long aprons CD4? in. CD4? There are some long aprons in CD4. Not uh, as many as there are on uh, the west side. As well. Okay, but it's not just the west side problem, so the full council City should know that. Yeah. Thank it's you very much. Right. Everybody appreciates democracy at its best. A motion to adjourn, so move. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much.